many of the things that surprised me were, uh, were things that didn't happen in my lifetime, but happened before my lifetime. And that everything that is coming to me is new, that hasn't happened into my lifetime, I have to study. And, and that's by studying the Great Depression, we were able to anticipate the 2008 financial crisis. So there's a mechanistic reason. There are cause-effect relationships. And three big things that are happening in our lifetime that haven't happened before, I needed to examine. And those three things, I think if we focus on them, they pretty much encompass most. Uh, those three things are, first, an enormous amount of uh, debt creation, which is debt that's monetized, that has to do with the value of money um, in, throughout history. It's been very much the case, in all cases throughout history, that when there's not enough money, there is the, then the creation of money. Rome, they had gold coins and they put other metals in it and they depreciated it and so on. So, so we have something that is going on with money, credit, and inflation. That's due to the fact that we don't have enough real money. Okay, that's, that's one fact. The second is internal conflict. Um, by measures, I like to have measures, and so there are lots of measures in this book. Um, we have populism of the left and populism of the right that are irreconcilable differences. History shows that when the causes that people are behind are more important to them than the system, the system is in jeopardy. And so if you look at populism or you look at the size of the wealth gaps or the values gaps, they're the largest since the 1930 to 45 period and it's understandable. And the third is the great power com conflict. Um, we began our world order in 1945, and the pattern repeats all the time. There's a war. The winners of the war determine the world order, the rules of the game. That's why the United Nations is in New York and the IMF in, and the World Bank are in Washington. And then you have the world order and the dominant power. The United States had 80% of the world's money, money was gold, and it had half the world's economy and it had a monopoly on military power. And as that power changes, um, then you have great power conflict. And so you're having these three things happen again for the, basically the same mechanistic reasons. And if you go back through history, you see that they repeat over it. So they have this cause effect. So I think that when we look at the future um, and we calculate it for, for just year by year, we're now in 2022. We're in the part of, they always do it the same way. You have a downturn and they print money and credit because that's the way that you stimulate the economy and so on. It produces inflation. They tighten monetary policy. There's a trade-off. Um, and, um, and there we are. Now, then you take that forward and you look at 2022. There's a political thing going on. We're going to have midterm elections in the United States. We're going to have a, a change in government, um, the 20th People's Congress in China, and so on. There's a political thing going on. And then you take 1920, 2023 and 2024, and with this populism, you're going to have possibly irreconcilable differences. In other words, it's entirely possible that neither side accepts losing in the domestic. And so when you have that going on, you need the historical context. So mechanistically, that very much looks the same. Naturally, everyone is in a position that they needed more money. Where did they get the money from? If there was limited money, they'd have to get it from someplace else. But what they do is produce money. So central banks produce money. Where does the money come from? You could have it from taxes and take it from somewhere else. But that's difficult because people want to hold on to it and they don't want to give it up. But nobody asks, where do we get the, do we have enough money? But we need more money. Everybody agrees we need more money to spend. But if there was a limited amount of money, we would say, where do we get it from? And we'd have constraints, but we're not like that. So what happens is naturally you're in the positions that you need more money. And so the, 
central banks uh, print more money. And then through all of this credit, everybody says, we need more money, we got more money. But then we devalue money, it becomes less valuable. And surprise, we get inflation. Okay, shouldn't be a surprise. Um, so when we are looking at the circumstances, we're now in a new era. You know, we wish that there's coordination. We're, we've lived in an era um, where we were global, and the way resources were allocated was where was it more cost efficient? So if it was cost efficient here, you'd send the capital, you'd build it there, and that would raise employment and so on. And that's what we've come to believe is a, is a fair system. But that's only because we've gotten used to that. But if you go back and look at history, and, and today, um, many people would believe that's not, not a fair system. So here we are in the fragmented world that we're in. And so the resource allocation system um, is no longer economic. The resource allocation is political and ideological. So when we ask ourselves and we wish for cooperation, it's understandable that we won't get cooperation because there is a risk, there is conflicts. There's an internal conflict of civil war. So how do we redistribute the wealth within our country? So we'll have it within the country. Well, there's a hell of a fight over that, right? And so there's the willingness to fight over that. And then the same is true internationally. So what is, you know, America first, or, or what is that in terms of that? And so I think we have to understand, we have to keep in mind that when we say we're going to cooperate or should, in a world where self-sufficiency, because we could go to war, becomes important. The efficiencies are no longer the most important things. Survival is the most important thing. The possibility of a war is an important thing. And it changes behaviors in ways that are logical, but maybe undesirable for those of us who are in a perspective that we believe that we should be in this together. And how do we work together? So I think it's all understandable. Okay, so that depreciates the value of money. We are going to have more conflict. We're going to have more inflation. Inflation um, causes domestic political conflict. So it'll be a big issue in the 2022 elections and the 2024 elections. That's just how the machine works. And in the meantime, we have, and the war in, in, the, in the Ukraine and Russia and with China is, a, um, is understandable in terms of a big, you know, the big powers conflicts. And so we see the world, if you read history and you see this happen over and over again, you see the world is now breaking up into sides. It's like their allied powers and their access powers and their neutral powers. And those ideologies become the dominant consideration. So it's entirely possible, for example, that we could see in, in, in China and so on that it's no longer desirable or politically acceptable to do business in China. It may, it may not be. Now you think about how intertwined the world economy is. 22% uh, of American manufactured goods imports come from China. So not just imagine the implications for inflation and the inefficiencies. That's just mechanistically what's going on. So as a mechanic who was looking at next year and the year after and where we are in that thing, I'm just saying it's, it, it's undesirable. And the unimaginable is becoming increasingly probable.